everyone, welcome back to the channel. You're watching Unbiased Magic Reviews. And today I've got a requested mentalism review for you guys. Several people have asked me to review this new project by Scott Creasy, which is called Paperwork. So today I'm taking a look at volume one, which is Open Billets. This was put out by the 1914, and you can pick up this volume for $46. If you want to pick up both volume one and two, you can get them both for $65. Um, before I start, it's important that I let you guys know that I have no disclosures. I have no affiliation with the 1914. They did not send this to me for free to review or to promote. I'm also not friends with Scott Creasy. I've never communicated with him in my entire life. So you guys know that this review is completely unbiased. It's completely objective which is why you guys watch my reviews. So I'm gonna give you guys a good rundown of what you can expect here on this, and then I'm gonna go over each part individually and give you guys my thoughts along the way. Now, in general, you guys probably know that I am a big fan of Scott Creasy's work. I have recommended his books and material in the past. I did review his sandwich peak, I don't know if it was a year or two years ago now, it was quite a while ago now, um, because I do like you know, his principles of, of mentalism, the idea that we use just a minimal amount of props um, because it definitely does elevate the believability aspect of what you're doing. Because if you really were reading somebody's mind, why would you need that weird looking custom deck, right? You wouldn't need that. Um, which is why I really do like Scott Creasy's work. So this project, volume one of paperwork, it starts out with him just going over some general principles of mentalism. Um, he does show you some different ideas for different types of cardstock you may want to consider, especially if you're looking at just using like double blank cards. Um, he goes over the psychology behind it. Um, he talks about how to get a lot from a little. Um, and then he very quickly dives into a couple of techniques. And some of these techniques have been published in his book, Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism, um, a technique he teaches you there. He does teach you a variation of the sandwich peak, and I say that because it's a very minor variation. The actual peak is almost the same, and then he goes over about six routines. He shows you like a drawing duplication. He goes over a version of the name and place routine, a version of fourth dimensional telepathy, a mental epic type effect, which he calls a bookless book test, he also shows you a parlor version of the fourth dimensional telepathy effect. And then finally, he goes over a version of Q&A or questions and answers. And that's really what you can expect on this first volume. Now, what were my impressions of this? You know, I was actually expecting a lot and I was really surprised um, just that this, vo this first volume, I was surprised with what he put out on it because I felt that the material that's on this first volume is inferior to what's in his book, volume one of Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism. The routines that are in the book are so much better, and that's because I think he just really violated some basic principles of mentalism in this first volume that he puts out. You know, as Bob, uh, Bob Cassidy used to say, um, he would say that if you are you know, performing a demonstration of mind reading, right? Like all of your actions need to be motivated well with the premise of what you're doing, basically. That's what Bob Cassidy used to say, that you have to have a logical motivation for what you're doing. And I feel like that that was kind of violated here and we're gonna get into the reason for that. But personally, my recommendation to you guys is to skip this. I think that this is way overpriced for what you get. And I would recommend instead that you spend $20 on his book, which you can get from Penguin Magic as a download, uh, Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism, because not only will you learn better versions of these routines that are taught here, you'll actually learn many more routines because there's like over 30 routines in that book. There's like over 20 essays. The book is like 360 pages. You're gonna learn so much more from the book than on this first volume of paperwork. And as I'm gonna go into here shortly, 
these routines they're just they just not very good and you're gonna see why shortly why I think that so you're gonna learn as I said a couple of techniques which one of them is in that book and then he goes over you know a simple gaff that he uses um, which if you've read any of his material you're probably familiar with it as well it's a very simple gaff that you can use with your business cards um, and then he goes over what he calls the minimalistic peak and basically it's almost the same thing as the sandwich peak that I did a review on the only difference is how the cards are cut and he actually mentions that he came up with this minimalistic peak because he wanted to be able to perform it without having a table because if you guys remember the person's card that they wrote on it will be returned to the pack um, and the pack would be like face up for instance and then the cards would be cut to the table several times and then you would show that their cards in the middle backwards and then you would you know whatever it is you would do in that moment so basically he came up with a version where the cut is done in the hands instead of on the table that's the only difference really and it does use a common card slight that most of us are familiar with I actually first saw Jerry Sadowitz do that slight that exact cut slight um, it's very simple to do, um, but the actual peak itself, the, the actual peak that you're getting is exactly the same because you're peaking the information from the exact same place. So there's really nothing different with the peak. The only thing different is how the cards are cut. So I would say that his minimalistic peak is a very small variation of his sandwich peak really is what it is. And is it better than the sandwich peak? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that it offers anything any better just because the cutting is done a little bit differently. In fact, I think the sandwich peak looks more natural how you cut the cards on the table. Like, that's just my own opinion. You might like it better. But that's the peak that you learn on here. And then he shows you how to do a drawing duplication with that peak. He also shows you how to do a drawing duplication with another technique that he shows you here which again he went over the exact same kind of pullout technique in his book as well scott creasy goes over his minimalist name and place routine here on this project and in this version he's going to have two business cards handed out to two spectators or to one spectator they're going to write down two pieces of information they're going to be returned to the pack and they're going to be cut into the pack each time um, and then you're going to show that they're in the center. You're going to take out a card. You're going to get an idea, an impression. You're going to write down the first piece of information. You're going to ask the person to name out loud what they're thinking of. And then you're going to do the same thing with the second card. You're going to write down a piece of information, have them name it out loud. Only now are you going to go through the pack, take out the two cards that are backwards, and then you're going to show that both the pieces of information were correct. So that's what you can expect on this effect. And I will tell you guys that unfortunately, this is the worst version of Bob Cassidy's name and place effect that I have ever seen. And the reason is because it violates the structure and the principle of Bob Cassidy's original effect. So Bob Cassidy's original effect that you're probably well familiar with because there's so many versions out there, um, the, really the effect is that two pieces of information are written down and then they're mixed up so nobody knows which is which. One is isolated as a target and the mentalist is just trying to get an impression of what that is. They write down their impression, it's put face down somewhere and only now does the mentalist look at it to see which one it is and to see what it is. They read it out loud, a spectator picks up what the mentalist writes and they can see that it matches. So that's like a big effect right there. And then the, the next effect is all pure mentalism because it's all pure mind reading because now there's a second piece of information that had been discarded that now it's just, you just read that person's mind and reveal it. And that's really what the effect is. And for those of you that have studied Bob Cassidy's name and place routine, you know that the effect is designed to really disguise the one ahead principle is really what it is. And that's what makes it so strong. But unfortunately, this version by Scott Creasy on this project, it just feels like a cheap one ahead effect. And there's a couple of really glaring things about it that make it so poor. 
The first thing is that the peak is done at the worst time when you would expect it to be done. The peak is so obvious and transparent, it's just terrible. And then the second thing that's really bad is that the mentalist writes down their information, it's put on the table, and you ask somebody to just say out loud what it is that, that they're thinking of. And so it just feels like one ahead from a mile away. It feels like it, you know, it almost seems like what's the point of going through the pack to take out the cards that are backwards just to confirm what you already know. You know what I mean? It almost seems kind of ridiculous in that way. So for those reasons, I think that this version of Name and Place is very poor. Again, it's the worst version I've ever seen. And if you like Scott Creasy and you want to learn a version that just uses cardstock and you don't want to do, you know, like the original version where you had to burn paper, just check out Scott Creasy's book, Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism, Volume 1, because he has a version there that's much better and it doesn't violate the basic concepts of Bob Cassidy's routine. And that version was called The Name and Name. So I would recommend that you guys check that out. Again, there's many different versions of name and place routine that exist out there and some are very elaborate, some are really strong. But this version on this project, I felt that it was just very poor. Um, and for me, it was the worst version I've ever seen of the name and place effect. I can't recommend that to you guys. I would recommend you stay away from it. So the next routine that he goes over is uh, his fourth dimensional telepathy effect or routine that's on this project. Um, and this was kind of a strange effect here. Um, of course, it's based on Animan's uh, fourth dimensional telepathy effect. And you guys may remember that Bob Cassidy really is the mentalist who has been attributed with the best version of fourth dimensional telepathy, which about 47 years ago, he really published it, which I think he called it ultimate fourth dimensional telepathy. Um, but he did publish in the 90s too, a book which was Journey Through the Fourth Dimension. And in that book, he goes over many different ways of performing fourth dimensional telepathy um, that I would highly encourage anyone who's into fourth dimensional telepathy to take a look at that book because it's excellent. I could do a whole top five review on fourth dimensional telepathy because there are so many good versions that exist out there. Now in this version that Scott Creasy put on this project, um, you take out six cards and you're gonna hand out three to either three different spectators or in, in this version, he just uses D. Christopher, has him write down three different names and three birthdays. He's gonna be revealing birthdays, really. Um, they are collected, and this is what's a little bit strange, they're collected just to be put out on the table again. So there's some card handling there that's a little bit weird. And then on one of the cards, he draws a question mark and puts it on top of one of them. Then he gets an impression, you know, gets an idea of who that, that could be. And he does a reading, tells them their birthday. And then he picks it up to kind of confirm it and keeps it in his hand, but doesn't show it to anybody. And then again, puts the question mark on top of another card and so on and so forth. Um, and so you may have an issue with how, you know, it doesn't make sense that you pick up the card to check to see if your revelation was correct. And then you don't show it to anybody. That's really... That's not a good structure. And the reason why fourth dimensional telepathy was such a strong effect anyway, was because the structure of the effect, again, it hides the one ahead principle. And it does because each time the mentalist is gonna reveal something, they write down their impressions, they give it to either a judge or the spectator that made that thought. And then only now do they either open an envelope or look at the information and read it out loud and then now the person can reveal you know your pad of paper where you wrote it or or wherever it is and so it makes sense why you're reading the information because you've already committed yourself and so this version by scott creasy unfortunately it violates that and it almost doesn't make sense why are you reading the information you know, when the person that you're giving the reading to is already confirming the information. So you don't even need to pick it up to read it. I mean, it's just so transparent what's going on. And so for those reasons, I would recommend that you just skip this effect on this project because I think it's very poor. And again, I will recommend another version by Scott Creasy from the same book, Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism, Volume 1. You can learn his version in that book, which was called 
3DT or third dimensional telepathy. And it is different than this version. And the reason why it's different is because in that version, you'll be using blank card stock and you're gonna have three pieces of information. And you, all you're gonna do is apparently you just collect the three and drop it on the table or drop it on the ground. And then you start with the first spectator, you start to you know reveal the information by, you get it, you get it, you get a, an impression, you take out a card, you write down your impression, you can give it to them. And now you pick up the card to check and see if you were correct. And they, they're going to look at the card to see what your impression was. So you can see that the structure is conserved in the version that's taught in the book, but the version that's taught on here, it violates the basic structure and just the basic motivation of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, again, so that's why I would say to just check out the version that's in the book. I think it's much better. Following this, Scott Creasy goes over a handling that you can do, which is basically almost the same, but it's for parlor. And in the parlor version, you can hand each one back to each person in the parlor version. So it's slightly better than the version that's for more close up. Um, and then he goes into the next effect, which is the bookless book test, which is a mental epic type effect. And personally, I thought this was probably the worst effect on this project altogether because it really didn't feel like a good mental epic effect. Um, in this mental epic effect, you're going to be using, you know, a stack of your business cards. You're going to explain to the spectator, imagine two books. So he's going to introduce this concept of two books. And I think the main idea for that was Scott Creasy was trying to improve or fix the force. But unfortunately, it just feels like a force. But essentially what he does is he has the person imagine that they open the book to a page and, you know, think about that. And then the mentalist is going to write down their impression. They're going to put it on the table, the card, name the page out loud. Then he's going to say, OK, imagine on that page a word. You know, the mentalist is going to write down their word. They're going to put it on the table. All right name out loud your word. Now they're going to say, okay, now, you know, out of these books, which, which author do you prefer this author, or that author, they're going to write down the name of an author. They're going to put on the table now name out loud, the name of the author. The problem is that at this point, now he picks up all three cards just to add them to the stack to turn them over to, you know, go through them. So there's no motivation for why you have to add the cards back to the stack in your hands. I think that's the weakest part of the effect. Unfortunately, it's also gaffed. So this can't be done impromptu with just your business cards. You are going to have to make a gaff to perform this. And as I said before, the force is transparent. It is very transparent. And unfortunately, if it doesn't hit the way it should in the middle of all this, you're going to actually have to cut the pack in your hands, which is going to look weird. There's no motivation for why you're doing that. Um, so for all of these reasons, for me, this was the worst effect on this project, this mental epic effect, which he called the bookless book test. Um, and as I've showed you guys in other reviews that I've done, the mental epic effect with business cards or even blank cardstock, this has already been solved. This problem, if you want to call it a problem or this routine, um, there's versions out there by Banachek and Osterlin, where you just use three cards and no extras. In fact, there's a version that was put out in like a Penguin Magic Monthly, one of those, which it was the exact same thing. It was just, it was just repeated. It was just reinvented again, the exact same effect, where you're gonna do a mental epic effect with just three business cards. That's it. You're gonna write a number one. You're gonna have a spectator think of something. You're gonna turn over the card, write down something. And then you're going to have them say it out loud. Then you're going to write number two, have them think of something, write down something. And then finally, number three. And the best part is that the cards are in the order of three, two, one, the exact order that you wrote them in. Um, and there's no extras. There's no gimmicks. There's no gaffes. There's no difficult sleight of hand. Everything can be handed back. Um, and in terms of the force, there are much better forces out there that already exist. So... These are all the reasons why I'm telling you guys that you should absolutely skip this mental epic effect that's on this project called the bookless book test. And personally, I thought it was the worst effect on this project. Finally, the last effect he goes over is a Q and A effect, um, which again is just going to be using um, your business cards and he's going to be handing out business cards to a lot of the spectators. 
and they're going to be writing down like their name, their birthday, write down one word, like a question in your mind. This is a typical Q&A type effect. Once they're all collected, the, the business cards are gonna be shuffled. And then what he does is he turns one over as a demonstration, reads it, you know, reads the person's name, reads their birthday, reads their question, does a reading to give an idea of what he's gonna do. Then he cuts the pack, and then the next one he turns over and he's going to do an open reading again. He's going to read the person's name. He's going to read the information. He's going to give that person a reading. But the only difference is now it's almost like a psychometric type effect because he's going to hand that business card out to the right person that it belongs to. Now, the third, the third card is finally what we would expect to be Q&A because he's not looking at the information. He's getting a sense of who it belongs to. Then he's going to give them a reading without looking at the information. Only at the end is he going to look at the information and then give that to the person. So that's the Q&A structure that he goes over here. And for half of the routine, he's openly doing a reading. So if you're into Q&A, if you like Q&A, it's a very strong effect. Um, unfortunately, this version, even though it's the best effect on this project, I, I didn't like it. And the reason is because Q&A as we know it, is where you're going to either have a bunch of billets or, or, or a bunch of information inside envelopes that are mixed up and one of them is going to be selected randomly and you're just going to get a sense of you're going to say oh i'm getting a sense that this person is you know and they're going to say their who it is their name you know can you whoever this you're going to say their name they're going to raise their hand you're going to give them a reading you're going to answer their question only now do you open it to confirm that it's them and then you're going to hand it back to them. So this is a typical structure of Q&A that we try to emulate or look for. And there are literally thousands of versions of Q&A that exist out there. And some are designed for stage, some are designed for more close up or parlor. But ultimately, the best versions that exist are these versions where you don't openly look at the information because if you're really, really reading somebody's mind, you don't need to look at the information. You're going to get a sense of what it is. Um, and again, I will tell you guys that Scott Creasy has published a version of this in his book, Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism, which is much better than this version. And I think in the book, I think he called it, mini, or did he call it mini q and I think it's what he called it. I think he called it mini q and in his book. And the only real overlap between this version and the version that's in the book is he does use a concept from Bob Cassidy, which was called Scorpio's message. Um, and he actually explains it a lot better in the book and gives you like a more information that you can actually use in your, in your performances. So again, the book beats out the, the book wins again. So those are all the routines. Let's quickly take a look at my rating for this project. All right, so you guys can see here, this is my rating for this project. And you can see that I've rated this as 3.0 out of five. It's still a positive rating, but unfortunately I cannot recommend this to you guys because I feel that most of the material on here really violates the basic principles of these plots in mentalism. And I am a big fan of Scott Creasy's work, and I just think that this project does not meet the standard of other stuff that Scott Creasy has put out there. And I think that if you are interested in learning minimalistic mentalism, that you definitely should pick up Scott Creasy's book, Minimalistic Metaphysical Mentalism, Volume 1. You're going to get so much for your money. And you're going to get you know, just so much more stuff that's useful and better. And the routines in that book don't violate these basic principles that I've gone over here on this. And just as an example, if you guys do watch the performance of his uh, book list book test that I mentioned earlier, if you watch the performance, when he gets to the end, you'll see D. Christopher's expression. He, his expression is, yeah, great. And I just laughed out loud because you could see that D. Christopher was just bored out of his mind because the effect was terrible. It was a terrible effect and it was transparent, just like I mentioned earlier. So for all these reasons, I think that you should just skip this project, at least this first volume, and just stick with the book if you're interested in this material. Anyway, if you guys think that I've left out something, I would encourage you to leave me a comment below. Give me a thumbs up because that shows me that you're interested in this type of material. 
And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I'd recommend that you subscribe so you don't miss out on these reviews that hopefully are gonna help you save some money so that way you don't waste your time or money. Anyway, thanks so much guys for tuning in and I'll see you on the next review.